Today we're going to be breaking the rules of the channel a little bit because I know this is Telosiv EV, but I'm very excited in the next couple weeks to be taking delivery of my first EV, a Tesla. And even though it's not the coolest or most exciting Tesla, it's not the one with the longest range or the newer batteries or even with the single piece castings in there, it's still an incredible vehicle compared to what I am coming from. So while yes, I am reviewing a gas car today, it's purely because I want you guys to understand where I'm coming from, what I've been driving for the past seven years and hopefully that'll make you understand why even the most boring tesla is a major upgrade for me so for the one and only gas car review we're talking about the hyundai sonata from 2007 we have a lighter grayish interior with a white exterior and you can clearly see that the paint has seen better days for sure but it's cosmetic things we don't care a whole lot about that especially considering a whole lot of miles on this car it was originally my parents they were not even the first owners of this vehicle but then they sold it to my sister and then sold it to me using basically what I had left in college funds. But this vehicle has been on the road a lot. We're currently sitting at over 187 and a half thousand miles on the odometer. And I'm happy to report that my parents, after buying this vehicle, bought two more Hyundais because of their pleasant experience with them. You know, as far as gas cars go, this is some of the more reliable ones you can get out of it. So I don't know publicly what they're known for. They may be rocking negative stigmas for certain issues, but the engine in the transmission and everything has been pretty reliable. No major issues with head gaskets or shifters or anything like that. A few issues with the starter in the past, but for the most part, a very reliable engine. Although not a very quick one, there's definitely some times where I'm trying to catch up with traffic on the freeway and it kind of struggles to just keep up with how quickly I put my foot on the gas. So even the slowest Tesla will absolutely be an upgrade for me. But while it lacks in performance, it makes up for in efficiency, which of course is something I care a lot about given I'm interested in making the switch to an electric vehicle and I'm planning on buying the most efficient EV on the market right now but as far as gas cars go this one is pretty dang good this vehicle sports around a 16 to 17 gallon tank and when you're driving at highway speeds it is able to just sip fuel at a very very small amount to the point that if I maintain a consistent speed and we've done this with multiple thousand mile road trips we can actually get close to 500 miles on a single tank there's people online that have said they've taken this exact model and gone over 500 miles, but it's sketchy because you have to get really, really close to empty and we're usually not that dangerous, but it does have a fairly accurate range estimator and that'll update based on the mileage you're getting. And when we're on those big road trips and we fill it up with gas after we've been driving at a consistent speed for a long time, the car will estimate that we'll get around 470 miles on a single tank. So that's something no Tesla can actually beat this car with is just trip time so like you can get to your destination in record speeds which my parents have complimented me on with our road trips up to their house or relatives places out of state i'll tell them what time we're leaving and then they see when i arrive and they're like man you must have been driving fast and i'm like nah we just kind of ate our food in the car and didn't need to stop for gas all that often so very impressed with the range very impressed with the efficiency of course there's other gas cars out there that get faster but this was you know not a hybrid and frankly just looking at the exterior of the vehicle it's a pretty air aerodynamic design, not drastically different from the Model 3 we're going to be getting in terms of general shape. It is actually a tad bit larger than the Model 3 though, pretty much in every dimension. It's like an inch taller, a couple inches longer, and I think even a little bit wider. But I have sat and driven in Model 3s before and they still feel a lot more roomy on the inside. This one just has a bit more bulk and of course not a glass roof, which just makes you feel a little bit more claustrophobic. But the one thing that me as well as my parents have always applauded Hyundai for is the inside insane size of the trunks. While there's no frunk on this vehicle, they do have a ton of space in the back. In fact, if you compare it directly to the Model 3 trunk, I think this one is a little bit bigger, but the compromise is that when you fold down the second row, there is a very narrow gap to access things in the back. So if you are not seating a lot of people and you're just folding down the second row, then you're kind of limited with how much you can actually take up in the back seat. That's one improvement that I noticed with the Model 3 when I checked one out is that the second row has a much wider gap between the cabin and the trunk. Plus the Model 3 can make up for that slightly smaller trunk with a full-size frunk, not to mention that a lot of the storage space in the Sonata trunk is taken up with a spare tire. Model 3 doesn't have that, so you could look at that as a win for the Sonata and a slight cargo advantage for the Model 3. So you win some, you lose some. But overall, having driven large pickup trucks in the past, both an F-150 and an F-350 very regularly for my old job at a mansion ranch, I am not a fan of 
of driving big trucks or larger vehicles. I wouldn't mind a higher ride height. That doesn't bother me so much. But what I love about this car is just how easy it is to navigate. The turning radius is pretty good and it's easy to fit it into narrow parking spaces and you get a good idea of visibility through the windshield. The rear view glass as well is pretty easy to see through with a very large mirror and the side mirrors are quite big as well. So visibility is pretty great for this vehicle and I've never accidentally bumped into anything or slightly scratched another car in the seven years of driving it. So I appreciate its agility and ease of driving. It's not like you're driving a big tank. Some people may prefer that feeling, but I personally really like having a smaller car because it makes parking like miles, miles easier than it is for big pickup trucks or even some full-size SUVs. So that's where a lot of the positives lie for this car, where I have to leave a lot of negatives though, is the interior, okay? It's very basic and it's very classic and probably pretty standard for 2007. You know, this car retailed for around $18,000 before dealer markups when it was new. So the fact that we were able to get this car for four figures is pretty amazing considering how reliable it's been, how efficient it's been, but obviously it's relying a lot on cloth interiors, which I always thought got a bit more hate than they deserved. But as you can tell, it's very hard to keep these clean compared to vegan leather or real leather. I was never a fan how with fake leather, it was really easy in the summers for your legs to get kind of stuck to the seats and it kind of hurt to peel them off. But hopefully with the next car, we'll have pre-cooling so the car won't get too hot on the inside anyway. But we've had the HVAC go out many, many times on this vehicle. There's a leak somewhere inside and basically we have to recharge the air conditioning once every year and a half to two years. There were several summers where it was just not working very well at all and we got a quote from the car repair guys and they said that it was going to cost like $800 to replace the AC system so that it doesn't leak and it only costs like 20 or 30 bucks to recharge the AC system. So because we weren't convinced we were going to have this car for much longer, we just decided let's use the band-aid approach to fixing the AC and not do a permanent solution because something else could go wrong with the car by then or we may not even have it. And also keep in mind there's a lot of complaints I have with this vehicle, but it's not that I'm necessarily searching for a solution. Some of you guys may have suggestions or like, Drew, you can simply do this to fix it. I know most of this stuff is probably fixable. It's just, I'm not that interested because I don't plan on using this car very much in the future. I don't really want to keep using it, especially once a Tesla is in our lives. But by far the biggest complaint for me and my wife in this interior is that because this was basically made pre-smartphone, like the iPhone had just launched when they built this car, it's really not aged very well. Well, for one, there's basically a radio and a CD player. Somehow, even back in 2007, this car did not have a headphone jack to plug into your iPod or definitely any modern day smartphones. And of course, it doesn't have Bluetooth either, which means that we have to use this aftermarket accessory called the Bluetooth to FM transmitter, where basically this connects to your phone via Bluetooth and then transmits your audio signal to an FM radio station, which you then tune into, and it doesn't really work that well. We live in a a pretty rural area so for the most part around where we live it works fine but whenever you go on a road trip you start interfering with all of these different radio signals and we've tried changing it to all kind of vacant stations but no matter when we go on a big road trip we always run into scenarios where it starts getting interference and then we can't listen to our music so oftentimes we'll just end up listening to the phone speakers because the 13 pro max actually has pretty decent speakers but it's not a great solution and it's a bummer because the sound system in this car is surprisingly good. Very low bass, gets pretty loud and remains clear. For such a cheap car, I'm genuinely impressed with the sound system in here, but the connectivity is just awful. Of course, this was pre-displays, so there's no GPS in this car. There's no backup camera or anything like that. It's pretty old, so you don't get those modern day luxuries like CarPlay or Bluetooth or even a headphone jack. So I'm very much looking forward to having a car that just has Bluetooth built in that will solve like 99% of our complaints. But the one thing that hasn't aged very well in these vehicles, is a lot of latches and handles and stuff like this little center console latch is busted so oftentimes when you accelerate really quickly or you're going uphill it will pop up and it won't fold back unless you manually push it back down and keep your arm on it. If I don't keep my arm on it, then just the natural driving around of the vehicle, it'll naturally pop up again. Also on many drives, this thing will just pop open all by itself without me pressing the button. I guess this latch has just weakened over time because if the car hits a certain bump, I'll be going 70 miles down the freeway and I'll see this thing flapping around. So that has not aged 
super well. Also, the lock and unlock buttons don't work very well on the key fob anymore. At first, I thought the battery was dead, but the trunk button and the panic button on the back still work. But essentially what that means is every time we want to lock or unlock the car, we have to do it the uh, old-fashioned way, just with the regular key. And there's only one keyhole on the whole car so often my wife or friends are waiting to get in the car because it's locked and they have to wait until i come here and uh either lock or unlock it for everybody and i've tried to rip this apart and get the buttons working again but uh no success there also the buttons on this vehicle have not aged very well for the media controls or the cruise control like i know some people hate on tesla because everything has to go through the display and they feel like that's dangerous or annoying i'm more the person that's annoyed by buttons and knobs because at least in my car, as well as my dad's Tacoma, like there's a lot of issues that happens with buttons and knobs. There's volume buttons directly on the steering wheel. And sometimes when I press the up volume, it goes down. And when I press the down volume, it'll go up. Like they somehow got their wires crossed. I don't know why, but we end up just controlling the volume straight off the phone because that works more reliably. But same kind of situation with the cruise control. I've played with it so many times and tried to figure out, does it want me to hold it and then tap it? And that results in different reactions. But no, even, when I hold down or when I lightly tap the buttons, there are still times when I'm trying to set the cruise control and it doesn't set. So oftentimes I'll end up pressing the button over and over again to try to get it to activate. And there's supposed to be an accelerate button up here. So if I'm on cruise control and I want to increase my speed a little bit, I'm supposed to be able to either tap that or hold that. But no matter what I do, oftentimes it will just turn off. Other times it will accelerate. It's not reliable. So that's why I'm not really in love with buttons and knobs on interiors because they haven't worked well for me anyway. I will give them credit. It's a fairly simple design though it's not very complicated and it's pretty user friendly as far as cars go i've seen a lot more complicated ones i'm not really a fan of having you know a gear shifter and the parking brake down here though i would rather that be storage space but that may just be because i've seen the model 3 and i know it's possible to have all of your controls up more closer to the steering wheel but it's not overbearing you know it's not too many buttons so i do give them credit for that but even things like the ac vents have started to age where if i'm trying to adjust them some of the fins are broken and we've tried to pop them back into place but they just fall out of place again so basic car stuff you know after about 15 years of ownership you start to expect these kinds of issues the only weird thing i would say about the button layout is that other than the esc off button there's a bunch of like blank ones that have nothing on them and that's probably because of manufacturing efficiency maybe on more luxury trims they have other buttons there but yeah there's just like three useless buttons underneath the blinker and light controls which have no purpose. <laughs> I don't know why they're there. The hydraulic lever for the trunk also has stopped working, so it's actually really, really heavy to try to open the trunk because it is a massive opening back there, so while it's easy to load stuff in the back, it's hard to kind of get that door open, and it slams really hard when you close it, and I'm sure that's probably an easy solution, but again, I feel like we're chancing it every time we go on a road trip with this car because it has so many miles on it, and I've read that a lot of Sonatas start to break down around the 200,000 mile mark, so I don't want to spend too much money on this vehicle only for some major flaw for it to break after we invest some money in it but i am very impressed with how the windshield glass has held up like despite all of the thousands of miles we've driven on it we've never had the windshield crack after seven years of ownership which feels bizarre like i feel lucky considering how most people have at least a couple windshield replacements within a decade however one thing that broke several years ago that i don't notice so much anymore is that even if there's no one in the passenger seat the passenger seat belt light will turn on so the sensor that monitors if someone is sitting in the front seat is no longer working, I guess, because if I'm driving the car by myself and my wife's not here, that light keeps blinking and it's like, hey, you know, your passenger doesn't have their seatbelt on and it's like, no one's there, car, and there's no way to turn that off. So it just kind of blinks all the time. But luckily, my wife is in the car mostly, so she's buckled up and that light doesn't have to go off too often. But there's really not that many luxury features in here. I mean, there's no heated seats of any kind, so that's definitely something we're looking forward to in our next car and also a more magnetic approach to these sun visors which have broken on the past when my sister owned it but luckily my brother-in-law seemed to have keep these things together so they're still working it does also have the handles which make it easier for when you have older people getting in the car which we do often give rides to older people in our family and they like having those handles the model 3 won't have that so there's a downgrade here and there but other than that it's been a pretty great gas car for us considering the price was pretty low and there hasn't been any major issues issues with the engine just of course standard oil changes brake pad replacements smog checks and the ever-growing cost of gasoline so while gas stations are quick they are annoying
annoying because of how many steps there are. One, you got your button because the can just can't be opened because the car doesn't know where it is. Then you have a lid, open up, form of payment, a swipe, and then you got to enter a code. Typically, after that, you remove the nozzle, pick what type, the cheapest, and then try to get the handle locked in the proper place, assuming you don't spill gas on yourself. So there's a lot of extra steps involved, and of course, costs a lot, especially here. Not a very clean, elegant setup. This is actually cheap. <laughs> Relative to cheap. Someone in Idaho is like, so simply because of the time it was made and the fact that it runs on gasoline is why we're planning on replacing it and upgrading to the Model 3. I hope you guys understand why we're so excited now based on the car that we've currently had for years. And I promise never again will I ever review a gas car. This was the last time. I don't want to do it again because I don't want to own another gas car. I want to keep driving EVs and I hope that all the other car reviews from here on out will be all 100% battery powered. Thank you all for watching. And of course, thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for kicking in an extra couple of bucks every month to support this channel directly. It seriously helps us out a ton, as does just watching these videos. So thanks again, and have an excellent rest of your day.